the Shell Booth Bard and Nicola Morris are partners in crime at uh, Host Wine. You will know this Host Wine Girls. We're not going to get in the middle of um, David and Sid. We're leaving BC behind, sorry, just for a little bit. Yeah, the topic then not have to be BC, so we don't feel like we're cheating, right? Uh, my name is Michelle, this is Michaela, and together we've co owned a company now for about 10 years, well, 15 years. And um, besides wearing red dresses, we do a lot of other things. Um, I think when we first started to, to develop the concept of house wine, is prior to that we met when we were working at Marquee Wine Cellar, and we had a chance to work with all sorts of people, clients who were coming in because they had a lot of money, um, people who were just coming in because they wanted to buy a dollar bottle of wine to have a pizza. And I think what we found is regardless of the purpose, people found, people were intimidated by wine. The person trying to entertain someone really important that had a thousand dollar in their pocket just felt that they had to know something about wine because otherwise it wouldn't look good. And then the person who walked on the street wanting to buy a bottle of wine to go pizza, they were asking for Merlot or Chardonnay because it's all they knew. So we developed past wine really to, uh, our purpose was to take away the pretense from wine and make it, make it accessible to people. And we, so we kind of developed all services to do that. Uh, whether we were doing private tasting, word tasting, uh, we wrote articles, we teach um, the Somali program, the double reset program. So regardless of what we did, we were really trying to make wine accessible for everyone. Um, what else do we do in the game? Well, one of the lesser known uh, services that we offer at House Wine is seller management, and along with that, hand in hand, is personal shopping. So essentially what we're doing is we're curating a collection for a number of private buyers and we're tailoring it to their tastes. Um, and that's anything from sourcing the wine for them to actually valuing it, organizing it in their cellar so that they can find it, and then giving a drinkability window so that they're actually going to be able to enjoy that wine when it's at its optimum drinking period. So I can guarantee you when we're working in someone's cellar, uh, it's dark, it's humid, it's cold. We're not wearing our red dresses. We're fully bundled in sweaters and jeans, schlepping cases. Essentially, it's like having a gardener come over, but rather than tending flowers, we're tending bottles. And so it kind of sounds a bit fancy, and Michelle was saying you're working a lot with people who had a lot of money to spend on wine. Um, so when we talk about seller management, it seems like, well, having a seller must be just for the wealthy. Uh, but we're living proof that that's not the case because both Michelle and I started collecting wine when we were students. And what was your upper limit for wine? Mine was probably 25 maybe for a bottle. I was pushing it. Exactly, exactly. That's when I wasn't going to be able to pay rent or eat or whatever. So we were able to buy wines at a really reasonable price and we still have some of these wines that are selling. So that brings us to our topic that we want to talk about tonight, and that is that you don't have to be rich to have a seller, or the unofficial title is aging gracefully on a budget, which is something that both Michelle and I think about a lot these days, not just in terms of wine, but in terms of life in general. <laughs> no comments. <laughs> What does it take to age? Uh, what do you need to age wine? Um, well, you know, just like people, um, some grapes just have better gene than others. Just think of Sean Connery, Kathleen Adburn, right? I don't know, I'm thinking about the actors, but you know what I mean, Jacques Clooney. Some people just have what it takes to age, and it's the same thing for grapes. Um, so when you're out there, there's a few key you can look for besides the grape. Um, we're gonna talk about famous regions, when we walk into people's cellar, they are kind of staples. If, if, no money, if money is no object, people have heard of Burgundy, people have heard of Bordeaux. These are the, the kind of wine you are going to find in said cellar, um, <laughs> in most people's cellar. Um, but um, there are other grapes and the other regions, lesser known, um, that you can keep in age. And so what does it take to age, Michaela? 
Well, besides having good genes like Sean Connery or Catherine Hepburn, Catherine de Novo, all those people, um, there's a few things that we look for. One of them is great concentration of flavors. And I liken this to painting your wall, right? If you just put on one coat of paint, that paint job's not going to last very long. It's not going to look very good six months down the road. Um, but if you put on a few coats of paint, you got a lot more concentration there and that concentration will last the long haul. So you may not have to paint your walls for another couple of years, maybe even another five years, depending. Um, the other thing that we look for are the pillars. Um, kind of like having your house, right? You need the beans to, to keep it standing. So this is what we call the structure of the wine. And one of the, the structural components of wine is the acidity, that mouth-watering sensation you get in your mouth, like I said, in your mouth, <laughs> the acidity. Um, but uh, this, this will help to for the wine to, to go for the long haul, depending on the grape variety. Uh, the other pillar is tannin. And tannin is the opposite of acidity. Essentially, it dries your mouth out. It's kind of like having tea that's been steeped too long. Uh, but the tannin is found in the skins, the pits, and the stems, and it acts as a preservative. And if you have enough concentration of flavor, then you can put your wine away and the, uh, the tannin is going to allow that wine to develop over time, um, you know, maybe 5, 10, 15 years and be beautiful at the end of it. I was going to say just like you, but that's pretty cheesy and people will think we're together or not, so I'm going to stop. <laughs> um, so we're talking about the Greeks who have the good genes. Uh, one of the first Greeks that we think of right away is Cabernet Sauvignon. So, uh, why does Cabernet Sauvignon has the good gene? When you look at the grape, the grape is very small. Uh, Michael was talking about where you find tannin. Cabernet Sauvignon has a very, very thick skin, and there's a lot of seeds within the grape. So that means when you make that wine, when you crush the grapes, there's not a lot of juice for the tannin. So that juice is going to leach out all of these tannins from the pips, from the skin, as well as the flavors of the cup. So Cabernet Sauvignon, if you treat it well, of course, if you're going to make a, a, a bad wine, a two-buck job, it's not going to last. But if you do make a good wine, you treat it well, Cabernet Sauvignon has all of the chances to keep well in age. And probably as a consumer, um, the most known wine that is a blend, and Cabernet Sauvignon play an important role, is Bordeaux. Right? Bordeaux is a, is a region in France. Uh, there's a lot of different regions within Bordeaux sub-regions. And if you look at it in the wine lingo, we often refer to the left bank versus the right bank. So in Bordeaux, you have five different grapes, but the two imp most important players are Cagabre Sauvignon and Merlot. And the ones that I would say will last the longest are based on Cagabre Sauvignon from the left bank. Um, Poyac, Margot, Saint Steph, all of these wines that Sid was drinking today for lunch, right? <laughs> um, will we'll, we'll keep really well. The thing is, um, you know, the, the world of wine is becoming more and more expensive. Um, the Asian market is driving the prices, and Bordeaux has never been as expensive. Yes, you can still find some good Bordeaux around the forty to fifty dollars in good vintages. Uh, that will last, but it's not what it used to be. So um, we're lucky when, when you're on a budget and <laughs> you get to play with a lot of, of different wines that uh, will last and not cost the same price. Um, for us, I think we've had a lot of experience with uh, Cabernet Sauvignon from Australia. Um, there's a producer you might have seen on um, the shelves before called Wins. Uh, Wins is a wine that at the time was at $20, now it's a big $30. Um, but the producer were in Vancouver many, many times, and we got lucky trying these wines going back to 1980s. And you know, at the time, that person was buying, buying that wine for $15. And what a great surprise when you drink these wines, you just wish you had another case of it, right? The truth is, today that wine is costing $29, and I promise you that if you put it down and you drink it 15, 20 years on the road, you'll be surprised at how well it ages. Don't get, um, you know, the French wines, like the French people, are a bit hard, right? When they're young, they're kind of hard. Uh, but the thing is, so, so when you try it, you think it does have to age. The Australian and the Californian cab or the Chilean cab kind of fool you because they have the tank structure 
but they're also very friendly. So when you drink and say, like, I don't need to age that, it's so delicious. Yes, it is, but if you age them, you'll be happy and surprised. Um, the other jam um, that we like to have in our cellar are Cabernet Sauvignon from Chile for the same same reason. Cousineau Macu now sells for $19. I've done a, a lot of experiments um, with Cabernet Sauvignon that ages for a very long time and we drink them and we enjoy them and again uh, you don't need to be rich to have a wine cellar. These wines age gracefully and they're delicious. So two, two Cabernet Sauvignon if you don't want to splurge in Bordeaux you know, these are delicious uh, treats. The other option is to just uh, befriend Sid, and maybe he'll open <laughs> some wines from his cellar for you as well, um, which we've done. He's been so generous. So Michelle has some cue cards for me because I don't actually have the memory that Sid Cross does. I can't remember, like, forget about the numbers. I just can't even remember the name of some of these great varieties. So she's going to help me along here. Um, Michelle was talking about the classics in the wine cellar. But what we really love to do is go off the beaten track. And if you want to find great wines at a really inexpensive price point, then you have to go to things that are perhaps less fashionable, lesser known, and generally they're going to be less expensive. But because you may not have heard of them before, it's hard to sort of stick, get your footing and get started. We're just naming a few. There's plenty out there. So we're going to start with Tenat. These are some of our favorites. We're going to start with Tenat. That's your cue, Michelle. So we're going to start with Tenat. There we go. So just so that you remember these grapes. So Tenat is a grape variety that we find in the southwest of France. And particularly the association with is with an appellation called Médiron. And Tenat, just as the name suggests, is very high in tannin. Right, and as I was saying earlier, tannin acts as sort of that to preserve it, as it were. So whenever you find a wine that's made from Tanat, or under its appellation name Manihon, which is also on the cue card, Michelle, if you go to the next one, um, it's going to have a lot of tannin, and in fact, in its youth, it actually is going to be quite grumpy. It's kind of like the French that Michelle was talking about, a bit hard at first, and it needs a long time to really develop a friendly disposition. But if you go to the liquor store, you can... Oh no, it's a, the, the French and the French Canadian are totally different. I know that, I learned that 10 years ago. Um, so if you go to the liquor store, Chateau uh, Montus, right, from uh, Alain Bremont, $35. It's a 2006 vintage, so already has an H on it, but still has the bones to keep going. So that's our Tanat. We're going to go to the next grape, and we're going to visit um, one of our favorites, Mouvedre. This is a grape we find in the southern Rhone Valley, the south of France, and it actually plays an important role in blends. It's similar to Cabernet Sauvignon in that it has that thick skin, and that's what gives the, the wine its color and its structure. So it's important in blends to give some longevity to, uh, to, to the wine, some structure as well. If you want to find or try a Mouvedre, though, on its own, go to the appellation of Bandol. I hope that's on there, yeah, wait. Uh, Bandol, in the very far south of France. And you'll find here that Mouvedre is playing the, uh, the, the, the starring role. And Michel and I like to call Mouvedre the wild child. Uh, because in its youth, it can be quite animal, quite, uh, quite gamey, but with time, it develops this really intriguing, savory, earthy note, and those tannins soften. And that's why we put wine away, because we want to enjoy the flavors that develop as it gets older. Next up, we have Alianico. So we're going to Italy now, and we could name one of, or plenty of the many hundreds of great varieties they have there, but Alianico is one of our, our favorite. Well, it's spelled with a G, but you don't pronounce the G. <laughs> I'm telling you, because most people say Alianico, and you're saying it so well. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so Alianico, sometimes people refer to Alianico as the Nebbiolo of the South. So Nebbiolo is a great kind of Piemonte, Barolo, Barbaresco. Alianico is uh, grown in the region of Campania, and then like Nebbiolo, it has those fierce tannin, and that searing acidity. When you find an alianico that has enough meat on its bones, you can put it away in the cellar for 10 years, and that overt masculinity it may have had in its youth, again, it's softened, it becomes more polished, more elegant, and the wine so delicious.
delicious to drink. Last, but definitely not least, and that's only last for tonight, go to Portugal. <laughs> go to Portugal. Michelle and I just did a tasting a couple of weeks ago, and we were amazed by the great value of wine we were finding in Portugal. Uh, but not only that, we found some wines that we wanted to put in our cellar. And most particularly some of the wines that are coming out of the Douro Valley. This is where we find port made. There's uh, many different grape varieties there, so I didn't put any cue cards up for that. But they're really focusing on dry reds as well. And one of the wines we had is the Quinta de Casto Vieillin uh, Reserve. $43, so it's not the $20 to $30, but still it's $43. I'm buying some of that wine, and I'm putting it in my cellar to see what happens to it in the next five to 10 years. Over to you, Michelle. Will you share with me? <laughs> so, we can, of course, tell you a little bit about why you age wine. And the thing is, why cellar wine? Um, it's just like a person, right? You kind of see that beautiful young teenager, and you can see the potential in them, but there's something about an older person who's kind of gained more complexity, and now they have a story to tell. And that's what the wine you're keeping in your cellar does for you. Just make sure you have plenty of wine to drink, and then you can have the patience to age the other. Um, most people, there's kind of two myths two myth, um, about aging wine. One of them is all wine can age, which is not true. If you have Beaujolais and Beaujolais in your cellar, just make vinegar or cook with it, right? If it's like 10 years old, Beaujolais and Beaujolais, it's no good anymore, right? Not all wine can age, and the other myth is only red wine can age. Um, that's not true either. There's a lot of fantastic, fantastic, uh, delicious white wine that can age. In fact, by, back in my days when I was a student, I was also a flight attendant on the side, and I was lucky because I was going to Germany a few times a month, and I was loving wine, but I was not working in wine yet, and I started to buy a lot of um, German reasoning because they weren't expensive, and that's all I could afford. Lucky me now, I have a lot of these wine in my cellar. Um, why can, <laughs> I'm gonna share with you it. Um, why can Riesling age? We can have been talking about acidity, right? Riesling is a grape that has tremendous acidity, um, and David earlier was talking about how a grape, the job of a grape is to express a sense of, of place. Of place. Um, and there are some grapes that are better at doing that than others, and Riesling is certainly one of them. Riesling, when you plant it at the right place, it just expresses a terroir. And when the, the, the Riesling is young, all you can see is this beautiful, bright acidity, lots of lime, lots of citrus. Um, but if you do have the patience um, to age them, some of them for 20, 25 years, what you start tasting is beautiful mineral complexity that there's nothing, there's not a young wine that will ever give you that. Um, they're very special. Um, during visiting, they're up to being tracked, they're not popular. Um, we're okay with it because it means that they're cheaper, but I think we have to spread the word, the word out there that these wines, even though they're you, they're a bit uh, dry, you don't have to be scared. Um, to be scared of the speaking French too much, I cannot speak English anymore. <laughs> um, Riesling, when they're just slightly of dry, people are scared of that sweetness. The beauty of these wines is about the acidity, because the acidity keeps you refreshed and balance that slight sweetness of the wines uh, that are just beautiful. And just to put in perspective, David was talking about the true selling for $2,500 a bottle on release. Uh, if you're lucky, because often it's more expensive than that. That's kind of the high end of Bordeaux. You can buy some of the best Riesling out there for $40, $50, $60 a bottle. And you're getting the very best from a single vineyard, from the best producer, and you can, you can age that for 15, 20, 30 years. So just think of other wines out there you can age for that price. Not many. Obviously, the other classic for white is uh, Chardonnay. Um, Anyone belonging to the ABC club here? Anything but Chardonnay? I see some not, yeah? Um, a lot of people don't realize that Burgundy or white Burgundy is actually made from 100% Chardonnay. Um, these are some of the cla classiest white wine in the world, no question. And they can age for a long time. And one of our favorite when you're on the budget is Chablis. Chablis is a little area north of Burgundy. 
Um, when you go there, people are not very friendly, they warm up with time, the wine are the same. When you add them in their view, they're really austere, really earthy, um, lots of acidity, I love it for sure, but um, the premier cru or the grand cru, the best wine, if you have the patience again, you can age them for such a long time and they gain a bit of weight with time, they become a bit richer, more friendly, with beautiful roasted flavors, roasted nut flavors, and again, they show that beautiful minerality that the young Chablis will never show you to the same extent. And again, you can buy your Premier Cru Chablis for $45, 50 a Grand Cru for $100, compared to other top wines of the world. That's a pretty good deal if you're hoping to eat that wine for that long. So if I don't buy Brazilian, Chardonnay, Chablis, Burgundy, what do I buy? So many other options, but I need some help from you. <laughs> so um, why not start with Semillon? Uh, Semillon is a great variety that we see in the region of Bordeaux in France. Um, and it's really what gives longevity to the sweet wine, the Sauternes that they have there. But Sauternes can set you back a little bit. So let's go all the way over to Australia where Semillon has found a home, and particularly in the Hunter Valley of Australia. And these wines are so interesting, the Semillon that we have from there, because in their youth, they're actually pretty neutral, pretty bland, with sometimes shrieking acidity, and not a lot more to recommend them. But we've sat down with a bunch of glasses in front of us, Semillon from different vintages, and you can see the color in the glass change, and when you taste the wines as they get older, they really develop some complex flavors, like this wet wool, which kind of sounds weird, but it's totally delicious, I promise you. Um, and sometimes it can become quite toasty, even if the wines have not been aged in oak. The other thing about Semillon is that, like most of us, uh, it gains weight as it ages, and that's a good thing. It has some nice richness, it puts a little bit of meat on its bones, and balances out maybe that shrieking acidity, right? Um, so Semillon has been, for me, one of the biggest surprises in my cellar. I forgot or lost a bottle of Peter Lehman Semillon in my cellar. It was $16 a bottle, not even from the Hunter Valley, um, but from Barossa Valley, not a place that we think of for H.E. Uh, Semillon. And it was eight years old. And I thought, well, it's totally done. I opened it up. It was so fresh. It still had so much life in it. I wish that I had bought a case just to enjoy it. $16? You can't go wrong with that. You lose it in your cellar, you're not going to forget it, or you will forget about that $15, right? So that's Semillon. I don't even know what's next in there. Oh, Shannon Long. So um, Sid made reference to Shannon Long that we have a plant here in British Columbia. In terms of aging wines, Shannon Long is a great variety that we have a lot, actually, in our cellar. And the reference for us is the Loire Valley. Um, now, the thing about France is that most wines are labeled by their appellation or region rather than the grape variety. So you may not see Chenin Blanc on the label, but what you want to look for, there we go, Savignier, Malouis, and one of our personal favorites, Vouvray. So these are the appellations, the regions that you want to look for in the label, but they're made from Chenin Blanc. And these were some of the first wines that Michelle and I started to collect when we were students. Uh, and Domaine QA, in actual fact, was, was, was the reference. $20 a bottle for their dry Vouvray. And I still have 1997, 1998 in my cellar. And I love opening these up um, because when the cork is good, anyway, um, they develop this really kind of honey, mushroom quality that, again, you don't find in these younger wines. So for us, Shannon is, uh, is a fantastic wine for each. Maybe we can see how some of the BC ones there, but we're not talking about BC right now. Um, last, but definitely not least, is Gruner Valiner, or Groovy if you want to shorten it. And this was a discovery from Michelle and I. We were in a tasting together a number of years ago, a number of years ago, maybe five years ago. And it was a tasting of Gruner Valiner's, and it kept the, 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 the Gruner's kept getting older and older and older. We went all the way back to Michelle's birth year. Can I tell them what your birth year is? Is that appropriate? So they went all the way back to 1975. That's ancient. <laughs> no, but, but it was still so useful and beautiful, just like Michelle is. Um, so what was it's so fantastic to see is to compare the younger wines that had that kind of citrusy, limey characteristic, and then try the older wines that had become really nutty, really mineral, really savory, and a lot like 
white burgundy, and yet they were so much more affordable. And they're growing it now in BC at Tulina. Fantastic. So just remember, wine doesn't have to be intimidating, and if you're not, if you don't have that very thick wallet, you certainly can age wine. There's plenty of options out there, and hopefully you'll learn a, a, little, uh, a few tips tonight. Thank you.